starting on time, even very slightly early. Um, make up for all that time we missed starting late with last classes. Uh, first up, super excited uh, to introduce Steven. He's going to be our third TA for this course, so hopefully you'll see him in office hours and see him online on the Piazza post. So I was hoping he could introduce himself a little bit so you get to know him better. Okay, well, in our mission, my name is Steven Beers. I am working here as a student, and of course, we'll have my office hours course pretty soon. I'm a graduate of CSUN, so I don't know too much about your classes out here, but I've seen a couple. I've taken the famous 340 out here, of course. And my background is more tied to security and networking. If you have any specific questions about, especially the defensive side of security, or any interest in, again, security, machine learning, type of subjects in this class, I'll be, of course, happy to help. Again, we'll post more information, and again, hopefully we'll catch all your answers and get to you to, to the panel with questions and posts and so forth. Cool. All right. things on the command line. So this is going to help you as we go further in the class. There's going to be more and more. You'll be interacting with a remote Linux system through SSH on the command line. This is essentially prep to help you get ready for that so that when we have the full assignment that's all about hacking things on a server that I give you access to, you're very familiar with this. Um, so there is, follow all the links here. At the basic, what we're using is there's a great website called overthewire.org. They have a series of different war games that are all at different levels. Bandit is their beginner one that kind of teaches you the basics about poking around on a Linux server. So you'll start here. You'll start at level zero, and you have to make it. To, so each level is worth 10 points. You make it all the way to 11, you've gotten 100% on that part. Does that part make sense? So all the instructions are here. Yeah. Two eleven, or do we need to complete eleven? If you get two level eleven, right? Every level is so you start at zero. Zero is worth zero points, and then one, two, three. So each one is worth ten. Solving ten gets you two level eleven. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is there an extra point for being eleven and beyond? Not yet. No. No, but feel free to keep going. I mean, this is something that is, you know, it's actually very interesting. This helps you uh, figure out, like, locate things on file systems, all this kind of stuff. It's very cool. Um, and it's really nice. But of course, then the question is, how do we keep track of your progress on this system? Right? This is just a, if you look here, you actually just get to it by, I don't even remember, level one is you just SSH to a system. I think, oh, you have to go to level zero. Uh, the goal of this is to log on. So you SSH to band, like follow the instructions here, you can get to level zero. And then to solve level one, you go forward. So it's about SSHing in the systems. So we need a way to track what you've done. As much as I love the honor system where you tell me, yep, I'm definitely at level 11, <laughs> I'd like a nice way to track. So there's actually a really cool website called wechow.net. This is actually like a global war, like security war game leader zone, uh, leaderboard type thing. So you can, oh man, I want to find them here. Do I want to actually sign in? Uh, da -da. No, I don't. Um, so they have a bunch of different sites. Of course, the internet is bad, which is why I preloaded this. All right. There's a bunch. So if you're ever curious about where to go for different, you know, war games, doing something on your own time, uh, this is. This has a list of just tons of different kinds of war games. And so, let's see, if we go to, how do we go to mine? I was gonna show you mine, but anyways. Uh, so it keeps track of your progress on these war games. So, 
There's a nice little link that describes exactly how you can link. So you create a WeChat account. So you have an account on this global scoreboard. Have your hacker alias, whatever you want. It doesn't matter if it's the same. Then every time you, you'll link the two, so you'll link the bandit with WeChat. And then that way, when you submit assignment two, which definitely you won't be able to see because I'm not logged in. Uh, hello, I'm not a guest. I don't know my password. That's okay. Uh, when, you, when you submit, what you'll submit is your WeChat username, which we go and look up, and we'll see where you are, and we'll score you based on that. And you also submit a readme that says how you broke each level. So just keep track as you're going on, just in a text, like just raw text, no, please, for the love of everything holy, no PDFs, no docs, like just raw text file, how did you do each level? Right, it could be simple stuff, we just wanna make sure that you've done it. And again, I'll reiterate, um, so these are open challenges, these have existed for a long time, the solutions are definitely out there if you search for them. Uh, I would encourage you, the idea is, this is practice for later, it's not, so uh, I would suggest you do them on your own or definitely understand how to do that. Does that make sense? Questions on this? Yeah. So we need to be running the virtual machines for this? So no, you'll be able to access their systems. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you'll, it's all, all hosted by uh, overthewire.org, which is open to anyone. So it's nothing special for you, you all. Questions? Yeah. Uh, that's part one only, right? Yes. Okay. We'll get to part two. So how many of you wrote really awesome bug free code for assignment one? Ooh, some of you. Yours doesn't count because we don't even know the language that it was written in, so nobody <laughs> could find bugs. <laughs> so, you've been hired to evaluate the security of a smart house lock system. The owner is, the person who's hiring you is considering 10 different smart lock vendors. They're really concerned about denial of service attacks. So what would a denial of service attack mean in the context of assignment one? There's just something going on with the lock that's preventing a user from using the lock or putting a key in. Right, so it's a program. So what would what would be the easiest way to demonstrate that you have a denial of service? Crash. Crash. The program crashes. Has everyone crashed a program before? I saw some of you in office hours doing it very expertly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? You've all done this. Now you're going to do it on purpose to other people's code. Yeah. So. Uh, so we're going to show them how insecure smart home lock systems can be by generating input that will crash the sample. So there's 10 different samples. I've taken these samples from previous year's code of submissions, some from this year. I tried to have them mix, some that we created. I also modified them all, so uh, if your sample was chosen, don't tell anybody. That's just slightly easier for you. You got maybe lucky on that one if you can find the bug that maybe existed in your code or didn't exist that I injected. So you'll notice, so part of the purpose of this assignment is to get you to read code, which most students don't understand is actually where you spend most of your time when you go out and actually program for a living. You're reading and developing code that's already been there. So you'll have to read other people's code. Uh, I've changed the syntax of all of these samples slightly, so you'll have to understand that, find a bug, and generate input that crashes the sample. Yeah. What languages are these in? Uh, I think all, I'd say C or C++, but I think all of them are C++. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know C++. So it means if we wrote it, anything else, it's probably not there. Yes, correct. It is. Unless maybe I ported your Python to C++. You can think of how evil I could be, maybe. <laughs> it's possible. Uh, also, these are, you know, Let's not critique, this isn't a code critique contest. So you wouldn't want somebody to say something negative about your code, keep your comments to yourself. Actually, I think it's useful to look at these code. I actually learned some stuff about crazy C++11 features that I didn't know about by looking at this code. So um, learn something by looking at the code. Uh, try to think how to be better, but keep uh, negative comments to yourself. So you can download all the samples. You'll see 10 different samples, A through J. Uh, your goal is to generate input to the application that will cause it to crash. And by crash, we mean a segmentation fault or otherwise crash or halt execution, right? 
So this is something that shouldn't happen. And every program, this will be something that will trip you up, every program is being run with the correct command line arguments. Across the board, everyone was very poor about dealing with command line arguments that didn't exist. So this is not a way to crash the program. Not that. Every program is being run like this. Secure house, something up. Blue bar, just like the example. Yeah. So is there definitely, like, have you looked at these and you know there's definitely a bug in these? For sure. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so we may have injected new bugs. We may have injected alternate bugs. There may already be bugs there. It's up to you to figure that out. Okay, so for instance, what we mean, and this is something you should do on your own, here's a sample C program that is not a secure house. We'll go over it very slightly. In main, uh, has a line buffer of 1024, character pointer test is equal to null, scan f 123 bytes at most as a string into line, into that buffer. If string compared line with crash equals zero, what is that checking for? If the input is exactly crash and nothing more, right? Crash, then character n is equal to star test. Why is that a null pointer dereference? Probably pressure. Why is it? Why did I put that comment? Is it a lying comment? Nobody's test is equal to null. Yeah, on line seven, test is equal to null. So we know that dereferencing a pointer will cause the program to crash, cause a site fault. Right? One of the classic ways of causing a site fault. And then you should never see this because this should crash at this point. Otherwise, it'll print out whatever you typed in. So you can you should download this locally, compile it, create a program, or sorry, create a text file just called test with the input of crash. And then if we run the program, so if we run a dot slash sample test and <coughs> use redirection to pipe in as standard input the content of this file test, we'll get a segmentation fault. <coughs> so then as part of this, so if this was a sample, and let's say there is a sample that crashed with the input of just crash, it's unlikely, but who knows, maybe that's the case, then you just upload this file test that has the content crash. We'll test it to see if it crashes it. If it does, you get points. Any questions on the overall how this works? Yeah? So we just need to find one method per... One input that crashes. We'll just talk about one program for now. So for, for a sample, find an input that causes that to crash. Any other questions? Okay. So... You don't have to do all 10. Are you happy, sad about that? <laughs> you can do all 10, yeah. I know sometimes, like, you want to do all 10. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know sometimes, like, the way you compile C++ code is like, you can see your claim can actually, like, lead to new bugs, like, certain ways. So, which one are we using this matter? It, you, each, so, inside each of those sample folders, so, like, sample A has the make file, the source code, and the compiled executable that we use on the server. So you have the exact binary. If you find something that does depend on the compiler, it has to work on the exact binary, because that's what's being tested on. All right, so you mentioned that there's five of them, and there's five more, so I have to remember there's five points out of 65. Oh, no, no, I haven't talked about the scoring yet. Yeah. <laughs> Let's pause that for a second. There's 10 samples. That's where we're starting with right now. I started by saying you don't have to do all 10. Okay, so, okay, slightly complicated because this whole part is worth 65% of the overall assignment two, but let's just consider that this is 100 points for right now, okay? Everybody with me on this picture? Okay. So, then, ah, that's annoying. Okay. So, each sample is then worth 15 points. So, you only have to do Seven out of ten for a hundred percent, is that right? For, for at least a hundred percent. And you get a maximum of 105 out of a hundred on this part. So you can do all ten if you want, it's still 105. If you do five, it'll be 75, so five times 15. That makes sense? And then eventually that'll be scaled to 65% of this thing. Questions on the grading part? all taking a math class, I assume, right? Yeah. So that 105 is like essentially extra credit? Yes. 105 out of 100. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> if, if we submit all 10, yes. uh, on, on, could we do that like as a security blanket in, in case one doesn't work? You will know right away. 
right? So it's on the grading system, it tests it right away and it will tell you if it crashes or doesn't crash. So you'll know exactly whether it successfully crashed or didn't. And you'll have six, I think six submissions for each of these because it should be very simple. It's not supposed to be complex, like, I mean, you'll know you can test it locally, does it crash? If so, yes, then upload that file, it should crash. If there's a major discrepancy, we should talk. Question? So we'll keep it at six. I hope you don't need 25. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's not something you can't, you can't really fuzz and test the system. Either it's gonna crash or it's not. I think it's pretty straightforward. And you'll find out right away that actually the testing is very quick, yeah. Six per, or is six, per. six per, So I can log in, I guess. So bandit, we challenge you to a and read me. Uh, sample A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, I said it's kind of 11 parts, but. Um, so you upload this, and then, so it'll either say, oh no, sign two status, there we go. So it'll say uh, pass test cr uh, crash sample A, or it will say uh, fail to crash it, and here's why, for some reason. So uh, you should be able to see exactly what you got if you crashed it. Good. You'll be able to tell people that you can read other people's code. This is like a, a major skill that you're developing. So, all right, cool. Is that it? Yeah. So um, we'll be submitting plain text copies of what we typed in to crash them for each one. You just you will upload the exact file that you use to crash it. So okay. like test. So like with that input redirection, right? Like in that sample, you would upload the file called test that the contents of that file was crashed. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Like once, like twice. All right, cool. Back to access control. All right. So we talked about the Unix access control model. What were the, so we had 12 permission bits for each file. Four sets of three bits, what was that about? What were all these bits? Yeah? Uh, read, write, um. Close. Read, write, execute? Execute. For what? For who? Uh, for either the owner, owner, uh, user, and guest. Owner, user, and other, uh, sorry, owner, group, and everyone else. So others, very close. So yeah, so that's three bits for each of those three groups. What about the remaining three bits? Yeah. UID, SGID, and a sticky bit. Set user ID, set group ID, and the sticky bit. Um, so sticky bit we won't get into. You can read it up. There's like a whole Wikipedia article if you're interested in the sticky bit. I think it used to be something about keeping a program in memory so it wouldn't swap out. So like the memory contents were sticky in some sense, but uh, now it's used definitely on a directory so that you can append create files and not delete other people's files or something like that, which slash temp I know has a sticky bit. Thanks. All right. So have we kind of conquered all models of access control? We've talked about access control matrix, access control list, capability list. We looked at a real access control system in the Unix system. We just like done. This is the end of access control. Yes. Let's move on to the next topic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not like the list needed, but like, it's just the past three long files. Yeah, so, maybe, so uh, maybe we could add some type of authentication to the file itself. So, for instance, um, they zip files, even though it's very bad encryption, have a way to password protect a specific file. So, we could think maybe we want to protect certain types of data or files rather than using an access control system. How do you bundle that access control into the file itself? So if you know the password, you can access the file. Yeah. So how would you model a hospital with this, like an access control matrix? Does a hospital have any access control rules? Yes. Like what? Who can access a room? Who can access a room? So who should be able to have access to a room? 
The doctor, every doctor in the hospital? No. No? Yes? Maybe? The employees may be assigned to that area, so it's a room in um, urgent care or something. Like, who, so maybe the people just assigned to that area. What else? Yeah. It could depend on the medical condition. Maybe a specialist who's not in that area gets called in. They'll need access to that room to be able to deal with the patient. You got something else? I was just going to put another example, like access to one floor. Yeah, so access to maybe a whole floor. Maybe you can have a whole floor's worth of access. Yeah. Um, the count for nurses and janitorial staff. Nurses, janitorial staff. Yeah, so these are all. Um, so, and, and then think about, so what happens if, uh, let's say there's a medical emergency and somebody's rushing to a room, but then their card doesn't work on the door. Is that a problem? You say, well, you weren't following the access control rules. You're not a doctor that's assigned to this area. Sorry, you, you have to request access from the IT people. Yeah, so you maybe want some, so there's all these other things that aren't quite captured, right? So in terms of context, right? There's all these things in terms of context of what's going on. Is it an emergency or not? That type of context, you may just say, you know, open all the doors. Like when there's an emergency going on, you want every medical person to be able to go in there and assist. And when there's not an emergency, if it's not life or, all right, life or death, then it's maybe, it's fine to go, go back to a more relaxed policy. So we talked about a little bit of, uh, we got into like this notion of password protection of files, like content dependent controls, or let's say, um, you know, there's, it could be interesting things to think about, like as a manager, you can see the salaries of all the employees that report to you, but you may not be able to see the salaries of the entire company. So there's some controls there based on the content itself. Um, Context dependent controls, uh, where you're, yeah, okay. So, yeah, we talked about some of this, right? The company's earnings report is confidential until it's released publicly and then it's no longer confidential. So, all these things can play into the context. So, there's kind of this rich space of things that we're not thinking about. Also, location. So, should you be able to, let's say, access sensitive information directly at your terminal at your desk at work that um, they provide for you? Should you also be able to access that at home from your home laptop, which is running God knows what software? Like, probably not. So those type of things come, to, come into there. Cool. Okay, now, we've been thinking about how to model access control. So we've talked about a matrix, right? We can draw the matrix. We can split it up, columns and rows, get access control lists or capability lists. But we didn't really talk about and we kind of punted a little bit on the question of how do those rules in the matrix get updated, right? So what are some of the ways that those rules change? How do those, where do those rights of who, what subjects have rights to what objects, where do they come from? Yeah. Could be like the owner of the file. Could be the owner of the file. So you may have a model where the owner, so there's a concept of an owner, whoever owns the file gets to choose who has access to it. What else? Yeah. Ooh, okay, that's interesting. So maybe you could have like shareable rights in some sense. So if you have a right to read a file, you could give that right to other people, but you can't let them write to that file. That's interesting. I've actually never thought of that. Yeah. Um, system admins. So the system admin. So an admin defines this matrix, and that's what it is. There's no changing it. Yeah, so these are actually all different types of ways of different types of access control systems. So this comes down to who can do what. So, and these are kind of important concepts because we'll see they come up in different, so for instance, well, before we get into this, so users can change the, can control. So discretionary access control, an owner of a file can decide who has rights or access to that and can change that. And what circumstances is that good? Conversely, the negative, what circumstances is that bad? Yeah. The owner has malicious intent. Yeah, the owner has malicious 
Do you have an example? Uh, it doesn't have to be you, but yeah, since you're gone. I guess like if you're an employee for high rank at a company and you just start with you get a promotion or something, you grant read write access to the earnings reports to uh, everyone. There you go. That's pretty malicious. That's good. Yeah, so you could, uh, or the salary information, if you granted read access to everybody in the company, do uh, you think that's going to cause uh, an a incident? Riot, maybe? Yeah. Or if the user just didn't need it. And, yeah, what if the user makes a mistake? We'll say, we've all made mistakes, right? We don't want to necessarily assume our users are idiots, but we say it's very much human nature to make mistakes. We make mistakes. So what if the user accidentally makes a mistake? So for instance, um, I got locked out of a, uh, a machine. I think I was in college. I'm not sure when. But I was admitting this machine. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but I was new at Linux. And I'm trying to figure out why my software, I think it was a Ruby on Rails server, wasn't working. And so I just ran like chmod uh, dash capital R. 777 slash to basically like, so the rewrite execute, set that for everyone, for every single file on the system. And my problem went away. It was actually great. Like, everything, <laughs> everything started working. Like all your weird permission problems when everybody can do everything to your system, they all suddenly go away. Uh, the problem was then the next time something happened with that server, I tried to SSH in and I couldn't SSH in. So I filed a support ticket and they said, well, your authorized key file, your SSH authorized key file is world writable. And SSH will refuse to let you log in with a key when anyone could write to that file because it's a terrible idea. And they also said, and by the way, so we can change that file. But by the way, all your other files have this insane open permission. I was like, thanks. I will fix it. So uh, yeah, so it's a good, like users make silly mistakes all the time, right? And if the you know, the key intellectual property of your company is subject to an employee's silly mistake, or think about the military context, right? Classified information just happens to get leaked because somebody accidentally ch mods it plus R and gives everyone read access to it. Like, that's not great, right? So you want a system and the ability to restrict what people can do. So even if you own a file, that doesn't mean that you get to decide what happens to that file. So this is this notion of discretionary access control where the user, the owner gets to choose who has access versus mandatory access control where you can think of the system, you can think of the admin, defines access and that's it and the owner can never change it. Is that it? So the only things we care about are the owner of the file and the system itself. So when you download these samples from the website, so you'll download them, you'll uh, untar them, they'll become local files on your system. If you're running a Linux system and you look at those files, who owns those files? You do, you're a user on that system, right? But do you actually own those files? I mean, did you, so is there anything that I could say, well, don't give those to somebody else? Would that be something I might want to do? What other situations does this come up? Has anybody ever watched a movie? No? <laughs> I didn't get a lot of yeses. <laughs> Have you ever... So, do you own that movie? Yeah. Yeah, so like digital rights management, like DRM, what's that an attempt to do or control? Piracy. Piracy in some sense, but what more fundamentally is it trying to? Sharing, or they're trying to, so you can think of the movie company as a company that is originating some data, right, some movie, and they want to control who has access to that. So they're giving you this movie to play on your iPad or laptop or whatever, and then they want to control that you can't give that to somebody else. Even though that is, you could think of that as a file now on your system, you are technically the owner of that file, right? 
And you can think this actually makes sense even in a company. Like I may want to give, um, I may want to collaborate with somebody outside the company. And we, I may want to give them a piece of data, but I don't want them to give that to somebody else. Right? So it's not just in the concept of, I mean, piracy is uh, one way of thinking about this, but it's the propagation and spread of information. So this actually ties in here because it doesn't fit in nicely with discretionary where the owner can control or mandatory where the system can control. Um, another nice thing would be, well, can the originator of the object, the person who creates that object, can they decide who has access to that object? Do these distinctions make sense? So we're going to look at this a bit uh, historically, in a historical context, so we can see why it's kind of important. So we'll look at uh, mandatory access controls. So uh, is anybody in or was in the military? Um, so you can help me out maybe with all of these security labels, levels, clearance, all that stuff. I'm, uh, I'll do my best, but feel free to uh, interrupt me. So the military is one of the key places where we have this notion of mandatory access control. So what does this system look like that we use, or that's in use, let's say? In government. In government, yeah. Confidential, and then um, there's secret. Confidential, secret. Top secret. Top, top secret. SCI. Top secret SCI, is that a level of Yeah, yeah, it's like compartmentalized. They're all actually just different um, caveats to the clearances. So like there's secret, but then there's also like secret don't form. Yeah. So like you can't share with your allies. It doesn't require like five eyes and like NATO, like it would be secret NATO. So you could share with NATO. Yeah, so so there but and can you just decide to whatever. I mean you have uh, classified information, can you just so it's pretty clear that you need some kind of mandatory access control system in order to control this information, right? You don't want somebody who has classified documents just to be able to say, well, this is now world readable to everyone. Right, so what's the process like for getting classified information publicly accessible? To the public? Mm -hmm. They have to file a demand for it. And then what happens? It takes like 20 years. And then what happens? <laughs> um, uh, it has to like get declassified, right? Yeah, There's yeah, a process to, to like get declassified. It has to get reclassified now, a new piece of data at a new level, right? OK, cool. So. Some of the things and concepts we've been talking about, security levels, so this notion of that there's, and nobody mentioned, but there's unclassified, right? So something that's not classified. We can think of uh, unclassified, classified, secret, and top secret. We'll think about those four for now. Is it classified or confidential? I can actually not remember. There's, there's confidential. There is confidential, which is between the two. Mm -hmm. really depends well, on clearance. I think confidential was the classified. Yeah, it's like it shouldn't be released, but if it it's is. It's more like hospital records, uh, PII, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Like, you don't have to have a clearance for it, but it shouldn't be like public knowledge. Cool. OK, yeah, that actually makes sense. So we'll ignore that for now. Because we're just thinking about certain terms. And this, we have security levels. We also don't just have this level. So this is actually a great explanation. So thinking about, so there may be data that will think US centric, because that's where we are right now. And we have people who are familiar with that system, right? So we have. So you may have whatever data that's at the secret level, but that we may not want to share with foreign nationals, even if they're friendly foreign nationals, right? So we need some other notion on top. Of, so with levels, right, we have a nice, I'm going to start drawing again. I apologize, but I can't help myself sometimes. Levels, we have kind of a nice hierarchy of levels, right? So we just think, so at the very top, we'll have top secret, secret, classified, unclassified. Right, so what does this hierarchy mean in like more practical terms? Yeah, so in some sense, right, it's should be some type of pyramid, right? Where the, as you go up, the less people that have access to it, probably the more stringent is the criteria to get that access. But 
<laughs> if I have top secret clearance, should I be able to read a classified document? Yes. Yes, yes. why? This Because it's you should have access to everything. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Yeah. We're ignoring that for now. We're thinking just in broad terms of if we only had a system with these four levels. You're considered more trusted. So you, you can only be trusted up to confidential. Right. So you're considered more trusted. So you can think of it that way. You got something to add? Right, and that's kind of the idea is this hierarchy, right? So if you have top secret clearance, it's you're cleared for everything there and everything below it, right? Similar with secret. Now, what about the reverse? So I have classified clearance, but I have a, should I be able to read a top secret document? Why not? Yeah, so that's violating the whole notion of what I'm trying to guarantee, right? So the thing about it both ways, there's the thing, there's the thought of what can I, what can a thing in terms of subjects and objects, what can a subject do that has a certain classification level versus I'm going to create some object, who do I want to be able to see that? Okay. So then we talked about what are some of the problems with this model of just having these four levels. Let's come up with some more examples. Permit sharing in what sense? Like for example, uh, other agencies like uh, so the, let's say the department wants to share with the NSA or CIA or anything. Yeah, so they have to make sure they're at the same level, right? Um, they may want that to happen, they may not want that to happen. What was, so somebody mentioned something about getting your job done. Who is that? Yeah? yeah. I think it was the guy in the back, right? Um, was it you? So, so now, if I give you top secret access, or you get top secret access, in a model like this, what can you read? Everything. everything that's top secret. Do you need to read everything that's top secret in order to do your job? No. So this, in some sense, violates the notion of least privilege that we've been talking about, right? Is you should have access to only those things you need to, need to actually do your job. Uh, other way to think about it is like a need to know basis, right? Like you don't really need to know it, so you shouldn't have access to it. Um, okay, cool. So what do we do then to solve that problem? Just add more levels to this hierarchy? Yeah, what we want to do is we want to actually branch out and add some notion of categories, right? So this is where we have the water. So I'll put. Uh, so I wrote like NATO could be a category. Uh, maybe NUC for like nuclear. What would be some other categories? No porn for no porn. Uh, <coughs> NF no porn nationals something like that. It's just NF. Oh, is it? Okay. Well, I can't erase. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe like alien. <laughs> So now, now how does this how does this interact? So now we have a set of categories. The categories aren't pegged to any specific level. So now how should these work and how should these interact? Yeah. Should be assigned to the subjects. So subjects should have a level and maybe a set of categories from this. And then what about objects? Yeah, it should be great. So wait, we'll flip it around. So subjects are people, right? So people have some set and also objects, right? Same way. An object, so some piece of data, a document, whatever, has a level and then the categories that are associated with that. So then how do I know if I can read something? So I have I 
top secret clearance. I should be able to read everything that's classified. They don't match. Yeah, I don't have that label, right? Cool. Everybody understand how this intuitively how this works and why and why it's done this way, right? I think that's another important thing. Cool. Okay. So you can even do this in office environments, right? I mean, we talked about it in terms of military, this is the most natural context because that's where that comes up. Uh, you can also think in terms of at a company, employee data, uh, uh, customer data, customer social security numbers, like privately identifiable or personally identifiable information. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So we have these great levels that we just went through. Uh, unclassified or confidential. Uh, unclassified, confidential, or classified, secret, top secret. You can have similar things in the commercial context, public, sensitive, proprietary, and restricted. So now, though, what policy do we want? So, what policy do we want to enforce? So we talked about kind of loosely, right, in English terms about what we want to have happen with these different levels, and we went through some examples. But what's the goal that we're trying to achieve? So you want to uh, restrict the possibility or eliminate, hopefully, the possibility that a, a file with, with thinking just security levels, an object that is at a high security level is not read by somebody from a lower security level, right? Cool. So we use the military example. We have top secret, secret, confidential, and unclassified. You change the classified. We'll just use C. Use whatever your favorite uh, thing is. So now we're, let's see if we can actually come up with a a way that we can, in some sense, prove or convince ourselves that we can design an access control system such that this can never be the case, so that we know that it's impossible for somebody to leak data. Would that be something that the military would be interested in? Yes. You want the mathematical like guarantee that no information can be leaked if you follow this system. So we'll apply some notion no, notation, and this is not meant to be incredibly complicated. But this is so L will use the level of the security clearance. So that's a lowercase L. So if I was writing it by hand, I would stylize it something like. And 
Suche an Büchern. You can access the file in the longer permission. You cannot access the file. And we have two roles for one person. Could we have two roles for one person? I would, so we'll talk about that in a second. You need some way to declassify yourself or to change your classification level, but that's more tricky. So let's say no. So one person, so a subject has one security clearance. So one security clearance level. So they're either, so we have our four security clearance levels, right? We have top secret, uh, secret, classified, unclassified. So every subject S, so if I said uh, what's the level of Adam, I can say that's top secret for one of these four. So it has to be one of these four. So every subject has a label and every object has a label. I mean, it does work for a system that, for example, is Adam both as a teacher and as a student in the same university, for example? Yeah, let's think about that. Uh, save that for later because we'll talk about that in a second when we derive our rules. So, a high level goal, we want it to be the case that no, right, our high level kind of English goal is we want it to be the case that an object that is at a high security clearance is never read by somebody from a low security clearance. So, if we were going to write a rule about reading, so we want to write some access control rule. So, you have a subject S who wants to read an object O. If you were to write a rule using this notation, when can S read O? Yeah. When the um, L of the S is greater than or equal to. So the security clearance of the subject S. Yeah, is greater than or equal to the security clearance of O. Is greater than or equal to the security clearance of O. People agree? This is kind of a key trick of solving a problem, right? So the, we know that the whole problem is complex. We have labels, we have, but let's ignore the labels, focus on the simple one of just four rules, and then let's see what we can do there. Can we even, because we can't do it for this, then we're never gonna be able to do it for a complex system, right? Cool. Okay, so, so we have this rule, so now if I said, can some subject S that has top secret, can they read an object of classified? Yes. Can they read a top secret object? Yes. Can they read a classified object? Yes. What about somebody with secret clearance? Can they read something with top secret? No. No. Is that what we want? Yes. Yes. And secret can read secret, so they can, in some sense, read down. That's essentially the rule we've written here. Right, so a subject can read down and read down to things that are more. What about writing?
Should or not? What do you think? Raise your hand for should. Should not. Okay, defend your positions. I would say that you have to go through an admin to get it classified lower. So the user themselves, uh, they have, they once they write it because they have top secret knowledge, it must be top secret until an admin could approve the process to make it lower by verifying that the information is, is not contained in something that should be top secret or higher. Okay, so thinking if you making it slightly more complex, but if we just think that there's no admins, whatever, right? But you have top secret clearance, any document, what was your logic? So any document that you create. Because you know the top secret stuff, it should be top secret, just in case you put something in there. Okay, alternative side. Uh, yes. It's like saying that your manager had like access to restricted information and can write emails. Yeah. Like, you need to be able to write like comms and stuff like that. <coughs> What's the security property we're trying to guarantee? Um, are we trying to guarantee that uh, managers can't write emails? Well, if you're saying you can't write something that's lower level security, and email would be you know, unclassified, maybe in this case unclassified, uh, you'd be really restricting their ability to do their job. Yes. But are we okay with that? With our, if our overriding goal is preserving the secret, top secret information and guaranteeing that top secret information never gets released. More thoughts? Yeah. Um, my thought is that um, actually it should be equal to their level and not lower or upper. Um, strictly speaking, if anybody is top secret, they should keep their top secret information secret. And since there are lower levels, there are people who can write the classified or unclassified at their level. They don't need to um, know the top secret stuff to write that. So it should just stay at the level you're at. Because you can keep on going lower. Interesting. Okay, so this is a slightly different argument, but you, you're arguing for no on the basis of you should only be able to write top secret information. So you should only be able to create documents at your level. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The nature of the top secret clearance is understanding the hierarchy and knowing how to not put top secret information in the lower document. Mm. I don't know that that's. I don't know that that's. Well. I'd say that may be true in practice, but nothing in my mathematical model says that these people with top secret clearance are smart. Yeah. <laughs> They're humans just like everyone else, right? They can accidentally declassify information, which I'm we want pro. to absolutely guarantee. Yeah. Um, I'm pro top secret only being able to write top secret and counter the email argument. That's why a lot of like, you know, high government people and top of those decks don't use like personal phones and personal devices to communicate. They have These are all great practical uh, arguments, right? But if, our, if I wanted, to, if you wanted to guarantee to me mathematically that it is impossible for somebody with top secret knowledge to ever leak it lower, you would not want anyone who has top secret clearance to ever be able to create a confidential document, right? Because there's always that possibility that they could accidentally introduce some top secret information. And of course, like everyone said here, this is an untenable situation, right? You've got uh, generals who can't communicate with anyone below them, right? Which doesn't really make sense. But in the context of this model and being able to reason about it, this is something that we would want to disallow. So for the purposes of understanding the limits of this model, we want to say that somebody with top secret clearance should never be able to create something with lower. Does everybody agree with that? And I will give you all of your practical limitations. We'll talk about those in a second, but. Like, 
absolutely guaranteeing that no top secret information is ever leaked to somebody who does not have it. This is a key component that you have to have, right? Because it's always possible. And you can think this will even prevent, um, you know, I, I mean, if you were able to enforce this on a system, right, this would still be able to, like, you can't have whistleblowers, they wouldn't be able to leak stuff out because everything they would create would be top secret. And so this is why they started with this model, because it's a nice mathematical representation of this model that you can prove that it's never the case that this happens. Okay, we have some other things. So then we look at this model, and we say, okay, what about somebody who has classified, should they be able to write and create a top secret object? Yes, why? What, what's the harm in it? Like, yeah, it's like pretty useless in practice, but like, they're not making anything available that isn't already known. Okay, interesting, yeah. Could you override the current state that's yet right now? Are we saying no, we're going to create a new object. So we are creating a brand new object. Okay. Yeah, so we're not, we, we could talk about that in a second. That's an interesting wrinkle. Yeah. I would say no, uh, because they're not top secret anyways, and if they just write a million files, how do you know which ones are trash and which ones aren't? Could you pay somebody to do that? <laughs> yeah. um, no, because they won't be able to read it later. No, because they won't be able to read it later? That's an interesting argument, and that's getting into more practical concerns again about are they overwriting a file, are they appending to a file, what are they doing? Uh, yeah. Ooh, there's no reason to. Uh, what about somebody, let's say, who's a spy who uh, only has classified clearance for whatever reason, and they're on a mission, and they found some information about an adversary's nuclear capabilities that uh, should be at the top secret level? Yeah. He doesn't have access to that information. He's not supposed to talk about it. They're generating that information, I would say. Yes. They need to report it somehow. Yeah. So here's the problem with not having the access Information is a difficult problem, anyways. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, you can't really determine who's going to run across what information. So you could have an unclassified person entirely in the government. So you receive, like, an email from a random, like, group in another nation that contains classified or secret information. Yeah, so we have a little bit. So you're poking interesting problems in this model, right? So even this notion of somebody with classified uh, clearance generating top secret information. At that point, they actually know that top secret information, so they uh, could technically leak it out by creating another confidential file. So you'd have to do that and then up their clearance to top secret as soon as you did that. Um, yeah. I think there's like a lot of arguments both ways, but if we just go off of the, you know, the specification you gave us, then our only concern is not leaking information down, and it doesn't even matter if we're really doing it, you know, to qualify that aspect. Right, so if we think about it just in terms of this overriding goal of we never want it to be the case that leaking top secret information to somebody with classified happens. This doesn't, does this violate that goal? If it violates that goal, then we can't have it. Does it violate that goal? No. no. Are there cases where that could be useful, possibly? I mean, actually, there you have a nice way of uh, just maybe solving your email problem of your underlings can email you, but you can never reply back and email them, right? Which is actually kind of nice. <laughs> right, so we can say we can allow it. This is kind of a, one of the things that's interesting in the debate because it doesn't, it's, it's something that's nice to have, but again, there are practical weirdness to it. Yeah. Um, so in this case, um, the classified person is writing the top secret file. Yes. Um, doesn't, okay, like you said, it raises their, their writing to top secret. No, let's say it doesn't. I mean, well, we'll say, this classified person only has access to classified data, right, by definition. Yeah. Like they have classified, they can read every classified data. They can create now a new file that is top secret with whatever they want, yeah. but they fundamentally not leak any information out. How is that any different from a top secret person writing as a classified person, since a classified person is also technically writing at a top secret level? The top secret person has access to all of the top secret information. 
And so they can create lower classification files to leak data out, right? So I can create, I can just copy a top, an actual top secret file. The deciding of a classification level, right? Like C, maybe just doing something dumb, but they're not actually leaking any information out. So in this case, how does the classified person know it's top secret? They have to know. So shouldn't every single person be writing top secret then? So nothing gets left out? Well, everybody in top secret can read everything, right? Yeah. So Well, it would be really it would already be displayed. Yeah, so technically, you know, it's now it's a possibility. It's uh Yeah, I mean it's an interesting weird case. I I agree. Um but the, I think the, going back to the overriding goal of never releasing top secret information, this doesn't harm you. Because a classified person has no way of knowing if this is actually top secret information or not. To them, it's just classified information. But yeah, there is a weirdness here. Let's see how we did it. Yeah, so we said, uh, S can read O, S, oh, good, look at that. So these are called, so in the model that we're creating, uh, which was like created and proved, I actually don't know when, maybe the 80s, maybe the 70s, maybe before this, um, the simple security condition, which involves reading, and the star property, which involves writing, these are things we just literally decided. The way to think about this, which is kind of more conceptually easy and why we've been using this vertical thing, is you can read down and you can write up. So somebody top secret can read down and somebody who's lower can write up. And then just with these two properties, you can guarantee that the information flow will never flow from top secret out. That makes sense? But this is a simple model, right? This is, so what are we missing from this model? Yeah. Kind of like these privileged ideas. Yeah, this category idea, right? Of saying that, well, maybe somebody at the top secret level shouldn't be able to read all of the top secret information, right? We want to compartmentalize our, the information a little bit, so we have our categories, right? So we can use these, I can't remember what ACE stands for. Do you want to make up an acronym for this? Uh, alien control entities, maybe? Um, it's, I took it from somewhere. I looked up like different labels for things. Because so this is an interesting exercise. Is if this let's say this is a label of a category, is the name itself classified or not? At what label? Why would why could it be classified? Yeah. Yeah, it could be named like uh, Attack Russia, like is the category. <laughs> like you probably don't want everyone to know that. So A, you either create a level of indirection and you call it something random that means that internally. And then that way this random name can be unclassified or even classified at a lower level. Um, so yeah, it's kind of funny to think like you may not even know the names of the categories because the category names themselves could be at a higher classification level. Yeah. It's like in movies you always see these weird like code names for projects. Yeah. Project Snow Leopard. But then an interesting thing is, if you have, let's say, a piece, a document, how do you know that what the ca classification of that document is? And are you allowed to read it? You just flip open and start reading through the pages? It'll usually stay at the top. Yeah, it should say, have a cover page that says on the top, but then you have a problem with what if the name is classified, and you know, it's weird. Anyways, man, this stuff's complicated. But, uh, we'll go with these three categories, just three. So we need to, so now how does our policy change? So what do we need to know about, how does our notation change? From we have this beautiful, just the level of S, the LS, and the level of the object is the object. Yeah. You need the level and then you also need a list of which categories or categories. Okay, set. We need a we need the categories, right? Or a set. Yeah. yeah. Right? You can't have more than one category, so we might as well use a set. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't really make sense. So now, and now we need to think about both objects and subjects.
objects now don't just have a level, they also have a set of categories with them, right? So we can say that the, let's say the subject security level and the object security level are both, let's say a tuple, just use a tuple L and C, where L is level and C is the set of categories. Everyone good? Not crazy syntax? Okay. So now, how do we compare subject S with object zero? So now, we want to control the same things, right? So we have the top secret, secret, classified, unclassified, unclassified. And we have, let's say, NATO, nuke, and ace. Right? So now, how would I define some kind of rule? Yeah. You could do. Um well, uh, you use the old rule where if the secure, uh, if the clearance level of the um, subject is greater than or equal to the object, and then you would add if the, um, I, I guess the set of uh, the object is a subset of the set of the subject, then you okay. that go. So then, yeah, so, that, so that's good. And then if, uh, how are we specifying the subset? What's the symbol we're using? S? Like that? Like subset or equal to? Yeah, yeah. If it's a subset of this object. That makes sense? Is that right? Yeah. Is that correct? So we can read this. So we why do we have this first clause that the level of the subject is greater than equal to the level of the object? We don't need it, let's get rid of it. No, you came up with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's kind of before, where like, what the first line does is it just gives you access to different levels, and then the second one just more fine grain. Yeah, we don't want to throw away this notion of levels, right? We still don't want it to be the case that somebody with unclassified can read top secret documents. That's the entire security policy we're trying to convey, right? And so then the second line is saying, OK, the the set of categories that S has must include the categories of O. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Does it? Include all the categories of O, right? All the categories of O, yes. Okay. So subset relation, right? So this means that if we have a, now we can go through and run through some now actually complicated or interesting examples. We have somebody with top secret clearance which has no uh, no categories, you know, and you should think, when you think about these things, you think, does that base case, the simple example still apply? So can somebody with top secret read something with uh, secret no categories? Yes, right? We could run through each of these prior examples just with empty categories, and it should be exactly the same, right? Cool. So now what about something more interesting, like top secret, uh, empty set, can they read an object that's secret with nuke? No. No. So, two questions. What does our model say and what, is, what should it say? So, what does this say? So, is the security level, is top secret greater than or equal to secret? Yes. yes. Is the empty set a uh, a subset or equal to the set of nukes? Yes. Yeah. Yes, so we should be able to access this? No. Yes, Should we be able to? So if we have no access to nuclear documents, we don't have the category for it, should we be able to read a document that has the category nuke? No. no. So what's wrong? Yeah. Well, the model is right. Okay, I feel yeah. like you did the symbol the right way yeah. and said well, the other way. Or, or maybe I'm reading it wrong, but the object you're reading needs to be a subset of what you have, not the other way around. So you need to be Back designated to that. Yeah, the notation. Yeah, the notation. Yeah, you, you know I mean? Like the whole thing. Oh, it should be on the left. That should be on the left. Yeah, sure. Oh, it should be on the left. No, you had it right the first way, which we're saying. It, it, oh, yeah, it opens to the big set. But yeah. you said it was a what subset. There we go. 
subset of S? Okay, yes. 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 So in this case, is the set O uh, the set containing new a subset of the empty set? No. No, it is not. It was just when you said the sentence. You said it. Yeah. So you said it as if you had the notation given. Got it. Awesome. Okay. So now we can do other things like. Now what if they're equal? Can I read this back again? Yes. yes. What about if the object has a nuclear and an ace? No. Cool. Awesome. So actually, and the cool thing is, Tuesday. We'll do that on Tuesday. 